Okay. Hey, everybody. I'm here in studio with the man himself, Joey Kornman of School of Motion. Um, Joey, how are you doing today? I'm doing amazing, Michael. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this beautiful space that you have here. Thank you. I'm, uh, i got to say I'm a little jealous. I Your office it, is a little nicer than mine. <laughs> yeah. No, we're, we're having a good time here in the Rosemary District here at Create Academy slash MoGraph Mentor. Um, but, you know, Joey's here in Sarasota. He's, um, you know, such an incredible uh, leader and resource in this community. You've been running School of Motion for three or four years? Uh, technically, it's been five, but no one had heard of it for the sure, first sure. two. Sure, so. sure. five years. <laughs> yeah. So we were kind yeah. of on a similar track. Exactly, Right yeah. around 2013, I guess, you're starting to put things together. Exactly, yeah. Um, School of Motion, everyone on this stream probably knows it, but we can, um, you know, just very briefly kind of take a peek at the website here. And um, you guys have recently rolled out a new boot camp. So let me actually pull up your courses page here. Correct. School of Motion curriculum. Look at all this. Absolutely. Yeah, we got more coming. More coming. More coming. Oh, good. Yeah. Um, so tell me what inspired you to uh, to want to start School of Motion. We don't have to go into a ton. I know it's been somewhat established, but just give us the... the sure. Um, you know, initially, School of Motion was really supposed to be um, like a lifestyle business. It was supposed to be my way out of the daily sure. grind. And, and it was really just inspired by Grayscale Gorilla and Video Copilot and sites like that. Um, because I, honestly, I just really sold the idea short. I had no idea that it would ever have the possibility of being what it is now. Sure. Um, and, you know, at some point I, I sort of left my old life. I started teaching and I really, really liked it. Um, and so that's when I decided to focus really on the school part of yeah. School of Motion. Um, and so after kind of coming up with this idea for a class, I built it. I sort of pitched it to my small audience, um, and the response was crazy. And so since then, I've just been sort of trying to hang onto the bull, um, and we've been adding classes, you know, pretty consistently. Yeah. Um, we're actually hiring right now again. We're going to be uh, a seven people, you know, full time sized company pretty soon. Uh, we're up to I don't even know the exact number of teaching assistants we have, but I think it's like twenty five or twenty six. Um, and it's just grown really fast in the last three years. And so now I feel this responsibility um, to, to really make it, you know, useful to sure. our students and, yeah. and to really live up to our mission, which is to help students learn and master and work in motion design. Yeah. What positions are you hiring for right now? So we are hiring for a production assistant, which will help uh, Amy, who is sort of our uh, head of course production right now. Mm. Um, they're going to help Amy do the gigantic amount of copywriting, video editing, podcast okay. editing, yeah, yeah. double checking, all of those sorts of things that sure. needs to happen uh, for our courses. Yeah. Um, and then we're also trying to find someone who can help us out um, making content for the site. So writing articles, potentially doing video tutorials, working with our contributor network. Um, yeah. I think we have 25 contributors now writing articles for School of Motion, okay. helping, you know, just helping us keep on top of the industry, yeah. um, doing th sort of useful articles. Uh, we just released an article that was very popular comparing okay. the quality of a Fiverr motion designer to like an actual <laughs> one that costs a thousand bucks. Okay. Um, so we just want to keep doing more and more of that. Yeah. Uh, and and just having the bandwidth to be able to keep our, you know, finger on the pulse. Sure. Um, that's kind of an interesting pivot into that discussion. There is, I think, a lot of interest and in talk about uh, are, are things going to become increasingly automated? Are there going to be stock sites? Um, you know, I saw The Mill recently tweeting. They built a piece of software that, like, spit out a motion design kind of video, and it was really good. Yeah. It was really, really impressive. Yeah. Um, I don't think we're there yet. I don't think it can be replaced, but give me the essence of what that, what like the argument of that article was making. Why do we still need to pay? Sure. For well, it's a good question. So, you know, when we went into it, it was really just, we were curious, right? Mm -hmm. You can go on fiverr.com. You can pay someone literally, I think with the fees and everything, seven bucks is do what. Do they have motion what, graphics on there? Oh yeah. Oh, they do? Yeah. Um, custom motion graphics. Like, you know, for we, seven yeah, bucks. the, the experiment yeah. was, um, so Caleb, who is our marketing manager and sort of our lead content guy right now, he came up with this fake brand 
Okay. Uh, and a fake story and a fake, you know, sort of, you know, request for whatever. And and he sent it to three different people. So a Fiverr motion designer. And, and what it was was a fake ice cream brand called Telescoops, a sci-fi themed, space themed okay. ice cream company nice. based in, I think, San Diego, he said, or, or L.A., uh, and you know has a small YouTube channel and wants mm. to increase their production value, so yeah. they want a little YouTube intro. Okay. So he sent, and it was really like a good simulation. Like he sent yeah. over a PNG of the logo and okay. to see if they would ask for the vector, if they okay. would just like kind of deal with it. Yeah. Um, and then you know we got three sort of you know work in progress renders back, and logo you can SBNI on the site here. you can read the article. Yeah. You, we posted all of the like yeah. version one, version two, version three. Um, and it was really fascinating. So we went in with curiosity and yeah. some, uh, obviously some expectations and hopes that very clearly the motion designer, like the real professional one that charges a thousand bucks, is going to do a better job. Yeah, uh, which he did. And we found that out uh, in a sort of unbiased poll where we took the three final renders from each of the motion designers. One cost seven dollars. One cost $150, that was from Upwork, mm -hmm. and then one cost $1,000. Mm -hmm. um, and we took the names off of them and just posted them and did a poll. Um, and the real motion designers was chosen as the favorite, I think, by like, you know, 93% or something okay. like that. Clearly, so that clearly is. one. Okay. Um, but what was shocking was actually how decent the other two were. Yeah. Uh, there were some people that legitimately liked the Upwork one the best. Okay. Um, and, you know, it's interesting, you know, everyone watching, hello, YouTube, uh, if you go read the article, you can see all of these. And the truth is that with sites like School of Motion, uh, you know, the stuff that MoGraph Mentor puts on your YouTube channel, yeah, yeah. Um, Video Copilot, you can actually get pretty close to good enough, um, you sure. know? And, and so the... I think the most shocking thing was how decent the very, very inexpensive Is it just people are. in other countries where, and they're willing to waste their time for $7 to produce something, is that? So I think it's it's interesting because once we put this article out, we actually got some feedback on it from our alumni. Hmm. So the Fiverr artist, we don't know anything about. I would yeah. assume that this person doesn't live in the US because, yeah. you know, given the amount of work that it had to have taken doing revisions and back and forth and even just emailing back and forth yeah. with Caleb um, for seven bucks, I just don't see how you make that work. Unless maybe, like maybe you're, an hour I mean, you know, I, unless they're a student and they don't care at all about the money, yeah. they just want to make something. Yeah. And actually, I mean, I, I've made that argument before that that's actually a really useful yeah. uh, kind of, you know, way of using Fiverr. Yeah. If you're a motion designer who's, you know, you're 15, 16, or you're in college and you just, you want something on your reel that's not make-believe, you know, yeah. and you want some practice yeah. dealing with clients and asking for money and things like that, if, it's great. But you don't do it for the money. Do it for the practice, right? Yeah, um, Upwork, we had students tell us that before they really had the training um, and the skills to be, like, good enough to charge a real day rate or go get a real job in the industry, yeah. they would get on Upwork because – that was the kind of work that they could get. And you're not getting a lot of money, yeah. um, but you're, it's, it's a level up from Fiverr for sure. Yeah. Um, and you're also, you know, you're also working with a higher level of client. The expectations are higher. Um, and you were going to make something anyway. Yeah. And you were going to do it for no money. So the 150 bucks. Exactly. Why not? Yeah. Yeah. So it was a fascinating experiment. Yeah. Sure. That's really yeah. interesting. So you yeah. went out and paid someone $1,000 to yes. do a version of it too. We actually so paid. Yeah. MoGraph, espionage. You really did the full. Yeah. yeah. Did the whole thing. thing. Yeah. That's and really cool. and the, the big takeaway, because what everyone, what I was concerned about was that the $1,000 person would not would do the best totally job. And that would like, it. then I would have to question everything. <laughs> um, so obviously there are things that are obvious, right? You would expect that the $1,000 motion designer with generally more experience yeah. is going to give you a better client experience, mm. right? They're going to manage the process better. That was the only motion designer that asked for a vector file of the logo, okay. like as an example. Yeah. Um, and when you look at the final result, the animation's clearly better, yeah. um, which as, as someone who teaches animation, I would notice. I'm not sure an, a client would really know the difference. Yeah. But the concept of the animation actually tied into okay. the brand, the right? Brand, it yeah. felt like it reinforced that space sci-fi theme okay. as opposed to the, the Fiverr artist just sort of animated Scale stuff. Everything animation. scales up or whatever, right? Yeah. Um, the Upwork artist added lots of little, uh, you know, like, 
almost like stock art of rocket ships and moons and things like that. Okay. That so okay, so there was some thinking there. I'm gonna reinforce this theme, but it was really heavy handed. Um, the yeah. art direction did not match at all the logo. It felt like it came out of nowhere. It was yeah. way too much. Yeah. Um, and then the real motion designer had this very sophisticated, snappy, fun to watch, mm. sound designed result. And it was a very pleasant experience for Caleb who was sort of simulating the client. Yeah. Um, and so the, the takeaway was really that uh, to be a motion designer today, you are competing with Fiber, Fiverr and you are competing with Upwork. And yeah. as much as that kind of sucks, if like you want to charge a lot of money as a motion designer, yeah. it's reality. They're not going away. And for yeah. a lot of clients, that's all they need. They don't yeah. need you. They don't have that kind of money. So you can't just compete on price. In fact, I'd say you should probably never compete on price. Yeah. You should compete on quality, the reputation yeah. that, that you have and, yeah. and the experience that you bring to Expertise, the client. Expertise, yeah. yeah. That's the... Um you know, the Blair Eanes whole, you know, manifesto win without pitching, win, exactly. which is don't compete on price, right. compete on expertise, be, uh, be the best or be the person who's going to do it for $150 because yeah. everyone in the middle will be competing yeah. uh, with the lower end. But um, there's such an obvious split too between companies like Sony and Nike who are going through agent agencies and real studios and are going to spend $100,000, $200,000 to produce things versus, you know, I think we've talked about it before, we're in an age now where kind of everyone is an entrepreneur, everyone, not everyone, but a lot more people have businesses, they have websites, they can put it on Wix or Squarespace right. or have a YouTube channel. So there's an explosion of demand on the low end where people maybe have $1,000 or $500. Um, that, that demand wasn't even there pre-YouTube and right. pre, you know, uh, pre the internet. Um, it is an interesting topic. I want to ask you a little bit about your time working as a director, creative director, Yeah. Uh, your time in Boston. What were some of the big challenges in working with young motion designers? Could you find young motion designers? Was that part of the challenge? Tell me about your time in, sure. in Boston. So there were a lot of challenges, but you just named the biggest just one. finding people. Finding talent, yeah. yeah. Um, so I was a creative director for a studio in Boston called Toil. Uh, Toil's no longer there, but the, the website I think is still up, toilboston.com, if anyone wants to check it out. Um, and so this was, uh, I think, five or six years ago was when I left. So, and I ran it for four years. And I mean, back then there were almost no good freelance After Effects artists in Boston. There were some, uh, but really there were no rock stars. It wasn't like New York or LA sure. where there's a, a pretty healthy group of you know talented, knowledgeable animators and designers. Um, for design specifically, there was one guy, like my buddy, <laughs> that yeah. I had met at a studio there okay. uh, who was freelance. Um, the other guy that was freelance, we hired full time and he became my co sort of co-creative director. Okay. Um, other than that, we would have to hire designers from LA, work with them remotely, yeah. which was doable. But for animators, it was a lot trickier. I don't think uh, mm -hmm. Frame.io existed at the time. Mm -hmm. There wasn't really like great tools to collaborate like that. Yeah. Dropbox was still kind of new. Um, and so that was a huge challenge. And so you kind of get, as a studio, what you end up having to do is hire young, mm. inexpensive is really yeah. what that means. Um, kind of raw talent yeah. and you have to mold them. Coach them up. Yeah. Um, and that worked for us, but it creates a lot of stress because mm. it creates overhead. Yeah. Um, as for me, it was very stressful because it was really my first time being like someone's boss yeah. and I sucked at it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I was really, you know, it was the kind of thing where it's like, I could explain why you have to redo that or I could just sit down and it, it could be done. Be and, 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 yeah, and I had to fight that. Um, yeah. But we had some great talent actually come through there. Kyle Predke, who I know you're friends yeah, with, yeah. Um, and who's done Super MoGraph Mentor, guy, he yeah. he was one of our first hires, um, and he came in pretty raw. Hmm. But and but over the course of six months or a year, finally, like he, you know, he yeah. could lead projects at that point. So that was a huge issue. Um, another big issue is just that running a studio because of the overhead, and we had a lot of overhead because we okay. were servicing ad agencies. We were right in downtown Boston. Okay. Um, we yeah. had a roof deck. I mean, it was an expensive office. Yeah. Uh, you know, you have to have higher budgets to justify doing the work. As a freelancer, 
if I was good to go freelance right now and someone would pay me 600 bucks a day to do freelancing and yeah. I could work consistently, yeah. that's plenty, right? Um, as a studio, you will go out of business real quick if you're only generating 600 bucks a day. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I could speak for Toil. I mean, we couldn't take a job for less than 15K. Yeah. It, I mean, sure. and even at that, we'd probably lose money. We were yeah. really saying like 30 to 40K was like the low end of the budgets we could do. Um, yeah. And you know, the work that we were able to create for 40 K was good, but I'm not sure it's better than what you'd get out of, you know, hire Jorge, hire JR Canis, you yeah. know, for a, you know, 10% of that, you get the yeah. same thing, you know? So, um, so it, it dawned on me pretty early. I don't think he's that cheap, but well, I take, but I take, <laughs> exactly, I exactly. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it dawned on me pretty early that, uh, you know, th the world is changing yeah that it's probably even harder now yeah as more individual freelancers are you know they read the freelance manifesto and they right. realize i can pitch on a job for twelve thousand dollars where an agency can't touch it for less than 40. right and the results will be so here's a good similar. example so right now so so actually one of the my favorite parts of running school motion is i hire a lot of motion designers to do animations for our classes yeah. we just hired jorge okay. to to do an animation and you know, if Jorge had opened a studio and he had all this overhead, there's no way he, like, we probably would have been very unlikely to be able yes. to afford him. Yes. Um, and we would be totally dependent on the staff he has because if yeah. they're available, he's going to pick one of them, right? Yeah. And hopefully he would he would hire good people. Yeah. Um, but now he's, he's freelance, so we come to him with a budget. He takes a piece of that and he decides which um, designer yeah. he wants to work with. So he's uh, working with Yuki Yamada. Yeah. Um, and the two of them can pull off, you know, the same level. Um, and then Ambrose, uh, you is doing the um, the audio. Yeah. So you have this dream team of three people, like thousands of miles apart, yeah. doing it for, you know, which... That would an be a world-class studio if you could get them all in the same... Exactly, yeah. and it would quadruple or more the price, yeah. um, but there's really no need for that anymore. Yeah. Now, there are definitely still situations where you need a studio, right? If you're Coca-Cola and you have 200 deliverables yeah. for a billboards all over Times Square, hiring one freelancer to do that isn't very smart, right? But, um, so there, but I mean, that's the level that sort yeah. of necessitates a studio, and yeah. a lot of things below that... You don't need the studio anymore. Or you have studios like uh, Gunner in Detroit who, you know, they live in Detroit, so, like, the overhead's way lower instantly. Um, they hire a lot of generalists, you know, who can design and animate, can do 2D and 3D. Uh, and so they, they can keep their overhead way, way lower. And they yeah. can deal with budgets that are still healthy but not, you know... 200, 250K budgets, which I don't even know if they really exist that that often anymore. Um, Probably very rarely. Yeah, I mean, at the high level, I'm sure they do. You know, Buck and the Mill, I'm sure still get those sure. those kinds of budgets. But, um, you know, but I, I'm a big fan of these, these little, uh, you know, sort of collaboratives. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, Ranger and, and Fox in Los Angeles is another yeah, example. Yeah. yeah. No, I think it's, um, I think it's a tough spot for for agencies, I think traditional ad agencies value was, you know, in the 60s and 70s and 80s, you just, large companies would have to go to an agency of like, you know, designers and illustrators and creative people and they right. work for you. Um, but also their value was like strategic ad buying. Like yeah. they understood how TV worked and the Nielsen ratings and they would like, or buy billboards in certain areas. Even that part of it's getting automated largely yeah. now is like things move into digital. It's very easy to just say, okay, we made this piece. Now we're going to spend that $100,000 getting 30 million people to see it on Facebook right. type of thing. Um, we're seeing more internal creative teams at right. corporations to eliminate agencies. Um, and we're seeing, you know, an absolute explosion of director led little collaboratives like you're saying like right. the director's the person you want we want Jorge because he's got great taste he's going to pick good people he's got those relationships right um he's in an incredible spot to yeah. compete with right. studios it's the same with like you know G Monk or, or yeah. Ash Thorpe if you yeah. hire them they can kind of hand pick their yeah. the team they want to work with and, and the make the budget way work. more efficient like you're saying exactly yeah a fifty thousand dollars to Jorge goes way further than um, a traditional studio, which is like, 
yeah, maybe you'll get a nice explainer video for 40 grand right. that you could get maybe for, for $10,000. Exactly. Um, it's, it's kind of an era where artists are really, really empowered, but having a traditional studio business is increasingly difficult. Yeah, and, and you know, maybe I, not even totally logical. I have a really, cases. I have a great friend in Boston um, named Michaela Vandermost, and she runs a studio there called Newfangled. Mm. And she was one of the first people. She, I feel like she's almost psychic because she she saw all of this coming. The old model, and, and I'm glad you brought up the ad agency thing because the there used to be this barrier to clients getting like a commercial. Yeah. You needed a 35 millimeter film camera, which requires mm -hmm. tons of expertise and you need, yeah. you know, an assistant camera person, someone who knows how to handle film. Where's the develop, how do you develop film? There were all these technical hurdles to it. Yeah. Um, and even after all those technical hurdles went away, you could, you know, buy, a, you know, a, an Alexa camera for 15, 20 grand or whatever and get basically the same quality um, you could capture everything digitally and never need a tape deck. Mm -hmm. um, and you right. could deliver digitally. You didn't have to you deliver an HD cam tape anywhere to get it on TV. Even with all those barriers going away, there was still this period where ad agencies and clients still had this perception that, well, but you aren't shooting on film, so it's not going to be as good. Mm -hmm. Well, you don't actually own a digi beta deck, so it's not going to be as good. Um, and and so studio, Newfangled started right at that point and said, I know that in five to 10 years, that perception will be gone. So we're going to build the company uh, that's lean, that's that's built on all this digital technology. Yeah. And we're not going to buy a giant, you know, we're not going to set up a tape room and, and a yeah. machine room and all sure. that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and it took a few years, but now they're they're growing faster than, you know, okay. than is even possible for them. They, yeah. they are constantly hiring. Yeah. Um, so I think that that is now, that idea, that idea's time has come. And yeah. now we're seeing a lot of studios like Newfangled, um, you know, Ranger and Fox is a motion design sort of version yeah. of that where it was just, you know, two friends that rented some yeah. office space, but they can scale up. They can hire a producer yeah. freelance if they want. They can hire a designer if they want. Um, and I think that studios like that are going to start to become the norm yeah. and the legacy studios are going to be competing for the, the very high end. Yeah, yeah. probably consolidate. I mean, the demand side is exploding. Yeah. Everybody needs some kind of visual communication, yeah. whether it's a, a video or, um, you know, print materials. So for illustrators, for designers, um, there's just so much opportunity. It's crazy. Yeah. And... You know, with Create Academy, I wanted a slightly broader umbrella because we're adding some more of these disciplines. And I'm to the point now where I just describe it to people as there are skill sets and there are applications of those skill sets. Yeah. You can be an illustrator, you can be a designer, you can be a, a filmmaker, a DP, whatever it is that you have, have some expertise in a lane, right. real expertise, and it's hard to even tell you exactly how that will be applied in right. the world but there's applications for it. And it's not it's hard true. to find it, right? You can spend 10 minutes on Google and see all of the ways in which these skill sets can be applied um, to make a living. And I think it's also why we're seeing such a push towards, you know, I think it's a good pivot. You wrote the Freelance Manifesto, guys like Chris Doe are, you know, YouTube channels blowing up. Yep. Because he's talking about that other missing ingredient, which is a kind of formalized business structure around getting paid for those skill sets. So yes. if it's the wild west now and we all have skill sets and there's applications, you got to connect it in the middle, which is how do I get paid for that? How, what does that look like? Pay my taxes, some of that stuff in yeah. the middle, um, where I know some people don't like it. They don't like that it's going this direction. Um, but people are going to have to be more entrepreneurial if, if those traditional studio models, you know, there's not going to be a studio that hires a thousand motion designers. It's just not going to happen, most right. likely. Um, so tell me a little bit about writing the freelance manifesto. What inspired you to do that, and uh, how's it going with the uh, sure with the book? Um, so the the reason that I wrote it, I mean, it really I, the way you just put that was brilliant. So like, I I saw that the world was changing. Um, it was like it was obvious to me even when I got my first full time job. Um, because the second that I saw a freelancer come in the door, do the job, get paid well, and then leave, I realized that is just a very efficient way of yeah. doing business, right? Mm -hmm. um, 
and I think the reason people don't like that this change is happening is because it's scary yeah. and you are raised your whole life in the United States to be taught that when you graduate, there will be this, this magical job waiting for you with open arms to hug you and bring you in and take care of you for the rest of your life. And, you know, our, our parents, our grandparents had that. Yeah. We don't have that. Yeah. It's gone. It's gone. It's gone. <laughs> I'm sorry. It is, right? <laughs> um, and so, you know, you, you need these skills of being able to reach out to people and find opportunity and tell potential clients about yourself. Yeah. Y- you have to be able to do that because, you know, to your point, like, you can make a living today doing just about anything. Yeah. It is staggering how much money you can make doing custom embroidered pillowcases. I mean, you know, just anything. The trick is not learning how to do that though. The trick is how do I tell people I can do it and prove Mm -hmm. it to them and get them Mm -hmm. to pay me for it. So that's kind of the impetus behind the book. It's really focused, excuse me, for uh, motion designers because that's like my my tribe. That's, That's what I know the best. But the truth is the the tactics in there apply to yeah. any creative professional. Yeah. Um, so the and book it's came... A pretty, it's a pretty long book. It's, yeah. I was surprised how, how long the final... Uh, There's a lot was. in there. Yeah, and I'm, I'm actually starting to think, because it's been out about a year and change. Yeah. Um, and even just in the last year, like, stuff has changed, and I sure. want to update it. And so yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm starting to think about, like, the second 2. edition, 0. maybe next year or something. Nice. Um, yeah, GDPR, you know, like, okay. there's little things like that. Um, mm-hmm. Just little things. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, so I, what I did was um, about three years ago, I did a live webinar. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, what I, I wanted to do this experiment, it was basically like, I, you know, I have this platform, School of Motion, um, and it's actually starting to take off. And I've always loved the idea of companies that when they start to become financially successful, they start to give back very quickly. Mm. Um, and so I wanted to like find a charity and raise money and like basically do an event and donate a hundred percent of the proceeds. Okay. It was really like an experiment. So yeah. I did a live webinar and I think I asked my alumni and my audience, I was like, what would you like to learn? And freelancing or just like the business side was just way Top up of the there. List. Yeah. So I put together this three hour presentation uh, and we, I think we had a hundred spots, you know, used to webinar or something. Um, and I recorded it. And after, you know, that initial hundred seats sold out, um, we raised $5,000. We donated it to this charity. Nice. And then, um, afterwards I sold it as a class for a while. Mm-hmm. And the reviews I got from it were like mind blowing. Like okay. I thought, okay, this will be useful to people. Yeah, yeah. It'll be helpful, you know? Yeah. Um, people were literally writing in and being like, I did what you said and I literally made 20 grand last month. Okay. Yeah. I had students make a hundred grand their first year using these tricks. And so I I, I have an email, um, label in Gmail, like Mm. filled with emails about this. Okay. So I was like, wow, okay, well this is great. Like I'm really happy about this, but the course was 80 bucks. It felt kind of weird. It felt a little off brand for us because we're the school of motion. And, you know, our mission statement includes teaching people how to work in the industry, but I felt like the format of, like, a three-hour course to teach you to freelance didn't quite feel right. Mm. And I also thought, just strategically, our classes are expensive. Our cheapest one, I think, right now is $700. Um, And so I wanted a way to give people a chance to see, okay, School Motion knows what they're talking about, get a, a little taste of like our sense of humor and our personality. And I thought a book would be kind of the perfect medium for that. Okay. Um, so I worked with this company to write the book and uh, it's been out a little over a year. Um, I don't know the exact number, but we're, we probably sold like 7,000 copies of it okay. wow. um, on Kindle and paperback. Paperback actually sells way better than Kindle, which okay. was kind of a shock. Interesting. Um, I've been getting requests for an audiobook version, so I might if I can, yeah, if I can find the time to go do that. (laughs) Um, but yeah, honestly, that book is like very special to me because it's not only like how to freelance and it is very, very tactical. Like it literally gives you email templates to use and stuff like that. It tells you how to track open rates and stuff. Mm. Um, but it also like, it's kind of this Trojan horse. Mm. Uh, and I think I say that right in the beginning of the book, this book is a Trojan horse. I want, you're buying it because you want to know how to get clients and how to do this professionally. But what I want you to think about 
is I want you to think about this lie you've been told your whole life, mm. uh, this set of train tracks that somebody put you on that leads in this direction, and you're told, don't look this way, don't look this way, and that train track leads you into a job and a 401k plan and this and this and this and this. You don't need any of that. Mm. That's all, that's the old way. We sit down and figure out what you want your life to look like. And I think freelancing is a tool yeah. to get that. Yeah. So I look at freelancing, freelancing isn't the goal. Freelancing is the tool. Yep. that lets you get to the goal of designing the life you want as opposed to just sure. ending up in a life that someone picked yeah. for you, you know? Means to an end. Yeah. I mean, I think there's a natural pull into freelancing because who doesn't want total autonomy over their time, right? right. Like so many of us, <laughs> it's just like, you know, I was... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right, right. I mean, I was in a studio environment and I really loved um, being around great artists and learning a ton super easy to get burnt out, yeah. super easy to um, just feel like, man, I wish I, I could be more in control of my time, like pick my own hours, that kind of thing. So I think right. there's a natural pull for people and um, just some of the structural dynamics we're talking about kind of necessitates that people learn it. So I think it's interesting you found that huge response and, you know, Chris Doe, last time I talked to Chris, he was kind of saying, I asked him, I was like, why aren't you teaching any technical stuff? I was like, you have this big audience, why aren't you trying to teach specific technical things? And I think he's getting more into that now, but at the time he was saying, he was saying from his perspective, people just want to understand the soft skills, like how do, right. they, how do they work with a client, how do they lead a client, stuff like that. Um, and it really is incredibly empowering, right? If someone can, if someone can acquire a skill set and like real expertise in something, and then have have the the wherewithal to understand value creation and how they get paid for things, yeah. And just enough about the economy to understand their place in this bigger kind of pyramid. Um, that's incredibly empowering, right? Yes. And the tools are all essentially free now. The information is is incredibly abundant. Um, so I think it's a real service you're doing to people to write that book and give them give them that empowerment that then, you know, they read the book and then maybe the next 10, 20, 30 years these principles are gonna serve them to uh, to work for clients around the world to make a living. And as you said, it's a means to an end. And exactly. the end being what, you know, then you get into the actual hard part of the question, which is what do you do with your life? What yeah. do you value? Um, that's that's a whole nother discussion, but I'm glad to hear that so many people are, are um, getting value out of the book. Um, we're here in Sarasota. We're just, you know, we're like two minutes from Ringling College of Art and Design. You were an instructor at Ringling. Uh, tell me a little bit about your opinions on the format of a four-year, and I talked to Jorge about this yesterday on the stream, and he was he's widely opposed to any kind of four-year yeah. program, his personal opinion. Um, but having actually taught in a, you know, a traditional academic environment, what's right. your sense of um, people pursuing a four-year program for something like motion design? Um, well, I don't want you to it, lose any friends. It could be a it could be it could be a short answer. <laughs> sure. So here's here's the way I look at it, um, and I, I've said you know I'm on the record and different podcasts talking yeah, yeah. about this too. But, yeah. um, I, you know my my opinion on this hasn't really changed much over the years. I thought maybe it would soften. You know, um, our mutual friend Joe Rust. You know, he he talked to me at one point about all the positives of the four year education. Joe Donaldson had an amazing experience, obviously. Yeah. Um, and many people come out yeah. and go to director level. Yeah, so like so it's, to me, it's not black or white, right? Yeah. If you come from, if you're lucky, right, and your family has the means to send you to a place like Ringling, Ringling is incredible. <laughs> I mean, yeah. really. Like, I don't know yeah. if you've had a chance, Mike, to look no, to yeah, go yeah. visit it yet, but I mean, the facility's amazing, the faculty amazing, the students amazing. All the things that come with a place like yeah. Ringling, the events and the guest speakers and the sports and the parties, it's yeah. incredible. Like, how, yeah. who would not want to spend four years that way? Yeah. The problem is the cost. That's literally the problem. Yeah. Now, there are other little things I would nitpick. I'm not in love with the idea that four years is the ideal amount of time to learn a subject. I think yeah. that's silly. Yeah. I think if you want to learn something, if you're motivated, you can probably learn it in six months. Right? If you had nothing to do but learn After Effects and you yep. gave yourself six months, in six months I could teach you After Effects, I could get you 
animating pretty well. Uh, and I could probably even start to teach you a little bit about design. Yeah. That would take another, I mean, design takes a lifetime, but like you yeah. can get the basics yeah. pretty quick if sure. you're motivated. Why four years, right? Yeah. Um, I heard this great interview and I, I can't remember who it was with, but uh, he said that the the standard pace is for chumps, right? <laughs> you're you, a lot of, you know, yeah. And, and it's interesting, too, because Joe Donaldson, who is brilliant yes. and an amazing artist, yeah. um, I look at him and I suspect he would have been successful no matter what. And that was my experience teaching. Yeah. That's been my experience teaching at Ringling and at School Motion. Yeah. The ones who are going to make it are going to make it. One of my students, I, so I, I taught mostly sophomores while I was there. Mm. One of my students was this kid named Jake Ferguson. Um, Jake is now up for an Emmy. Um, he worked at Imaginary Forces for a while. Um, he just directed the title sequence to uh, Fitzy or Paws Fest, one of those. Mm. He directed this title sequence. He's brilliant. Mm. And I knew the moment I saw his first homework assignment, okay, he's going to make it. Yeah. Right? All I had to do was stay out of his way okay. and not trip him up okay. and not slow him down. Okay. And if he'd gone to Ringling, if he'd gone to School of Motion, if he'd just watched YouTube tutorials, he was still going to make it, right? Yeah. On the other hand, there were students there that weren't going to make it. Mm. They just weren't, yeah. right? And and I I don't know why. That's above my pay grade. They just weren't. Okay. Um, they just couldn't do it. And and but it's not an effort. It's not. You're not identifying it as an effort issue. They were trying. It just wasn't. Some students didn't try. <laughs> there was. I won't name any names. There's one student there who was really very gifted, very talented, mm. um, but didn't try at all, um, and almost okay. didn't graduate. And um, and that's always a shame, right? So but but yeah, most yeah. of the time, that that was kind of a rare case. The the yeah. the, mo the the normal case that kind of got to me was the really hardworking, nice, good person yeah. that just doesn't have it, mm. right? And and that's it's kind of. Is Sometimes about, I go is it back about and taste. Is it they can't identify the work isn't good? You know, it, it's I've thought about it a lot, and I'm, I'm still not exactly sure yeah. what it is like. You know, everyone's met somebody that just seems to have a knack for stuff, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, I, I I'm a musician. I've played drums for 25 years, and it's you know it's strange. Like I we would audition guitar players, right? And some guitar players would come in and they'd been playing guitar for 20 years and no matter what you did, they could not keep a, sta like a, a steady beat. Okay. They just couldn't, mm. their brain was wired differently. Who knows what it is? That's yeah. not their thing, right? There are lots of things I'm not good at. There are way more things I suck at yeah. than things I'm good at. And so this is why I love what you're doing. A gap year is the perfect place to try things and find out that that's not your thing. Sure. Right. And it's not to say like you try something, you're not good at it right away. You should quit. What I mean is if you're working with someone like you and someone comes in and they're trying to learn after effects, I bet within like a week you get a pretty good sense of their potential. Mm. Right. You, you see you work with enough students, you, you can you can get it pretty quick. Yeah. And so if someone comes in and they are and they are just beating their head against it and going nowhere mm. and, and you're like listen, like, I know you, you want to be good at this and maybe you could be, it's going to take you a really long time mm. and it's going to be very hard for you to get hired with the level that you're at. Yeah. Okay. Well, if all you did was spend one month at Create Academy or two months or three months to find that out, yeah. I mean, you didn't lose anything, yeah. right? You lost nothing. You gained yeah. experience, you learned something. Yeah. Cool. You move on. If you go to Ringling for four years and find that out at the end, which a lot of my students did, mm the rest of your life is really messed up. So you think there's kids who went all the way through who are not employable? I know uh, for a fact that there are kids that, and, and okay, so everyone's employable, right? There's always a level you can get, okay. you can get, okay? Yeah. But if you have $220,000 yeah. in student loans. And you've been making six figures. And in a serious the way. best you can get is a $36,000 a year job. Yeah. I had one student, and this broke my heart. Um, this student, when I was teaching, um, was like, you know, sort of like middle of the class, like maybe slightly above average, but like not like rock star or anything like that, but just really hardworking, amazing person, um, re really liked them. Um, and they got an offer to work at one of the top studios in Chicago. Mm. 
And, and th this was two years after I taught her and, and she reached out and was like, I'd love to take this opportunity. The problem is it's entry level. They obviously aren't going to pay that much. Um, and I have these giant student loan payments that are going to start. And my advice was move heaven and earth, do whatever you can, yeah. like work five jobs, try to make it work so you can take that job. Because if you, if you can, and you can stay there a year, just a year, yeah. you're Maybe set. You start to climb that ladder. Couldn't do it. Finances do it. wouldn't work. Because, so, it, so it was ironic to me, the, the institution that like sort of ostensibly gave her the skills yeah. to get that job also prevented her from taking that job. Yeah. And, and so I look at it like, okay, if, if a place like Create Academy or School of Motion or MoGraph Mentor can give someone 80% of those skills yeah. for, I mean, it's not even 20% of the cost. It might be 5% of the cost. Yeah. Um, then I would just recommend doing that. Yeah. And there's a lot of questions that come from that. Well, how do you then, you know, you're 18 when you go to college. How do you kind of get seasoned and become an adult, right? Yeah. Well, I don't have the answer to that, but I can tell you there are other ways to do that sure. than going to college. Sure. Gap year being probably a really a really good way to do that. Yeah. No, I mean, that's an interesting part of it. The, you know, it's a newer question, too, because it didn't used to be this expensive. Like, yeah. I really feel like in the last, you can look at the data, it's like the last 10 years, the costs have really, really shot up. Yeah. Um, yeah, we were trying to hire an intern who, um, who had student loans not at all related to art school. But, you know, we're only offering 10 bucks an hour on, on an internship. And right. it was like, no way, I can't, I can't spend my time doing this, even though I would like to be in the environment and start doing these things because I'm really interested. Um, but, you know, I have to work at Chipotle. Will they, will they pay me 15 bucks an hour type right. of thing? Um, so that's really, a, that's an unfortunate part of it that you're yeah. kind of locked into what you need to do. I've always said that if you're going to do Ringling, you have to leave in that top 10 or 15% tier you have to go make $100,000 a year. If you're gonna borrow that kind of money, you need to make serious cash. You right. gotta go to LA or New York, probably, or San Francisco, um, or you know, in, you know, Lon London or Sydney, where the wages are, are super high. Right. Um, right, it's not feasible to make 40 grand in Nashville with 200,000 grand in debt. Like, that's a terrible, that's, yeah. a, that's a disaster yeah. for that individual. Um, I mean, it's an interesting, it's an interesting question. I'm bringing in all these, you know, Ringling students onto vlogcasts and stuff. And, yeah. Um, you know, a lot of them are saying, well, you know, I didn't have to pay the full thing because, you know, there was scholarships right, here. And they're right. like, so not everybody pays the full of course, sticker yeah. price. Some people do. Um, you know, the other ingredient there that we're kind of talking about, too, is the it is the formative experience of an institution, becoming right. an adult. Okay, you're 18, you don't know anything about anything. You need to study the humanities. I believe the liberal arts and the humanities are good things for young people to study. The of humanities course. is understanding people, the human being, and then understanding human beings in groups. So they make right. you study anthropology or sociology or psychology um, because it is that search for, it is a search for values, right? It is, you know, the veritas, the search for truth which is um, essential to forming your values. So like once you learn how to do things, right. the question is, well, what do you do with your life? Okay, you're making money and you have skills. What matters to you? How are right. you going to not regret your life on your, on your on deathbed? Your death, yeah. um, which, is a real, which is a real question, a real serious question um, that we all face. And I think um, that's why here at Create Academy, we, there is going to be an emphasis on the liberal arts, asking students to engage in reading and writing in in the subjects of the humanities, right. and then try to bring that back around to their vocational applications. Yeah, uh, because it is important. You know, I think the hard part, as I've been talking to to various educators at the high school level, the hard part is going to be getting kids to care about that at all when they're 18 years right, old. Right, right, <laughs> yeah. Not that interested. Uh, maybe when you get into your later 20s, you can start to reflect more and, and think about that thing, those types of things, but. Hopefully it's not a massive missed opportunity for an 18 year old. If they go to Ringling or they go to a great art school and they're gonna spend the money and they are gonna have to study parts of the humanities, um, a lot of the people I talk to, it's like they glossed over it, they didn't care that much. Right. So that kind of knocks at the value of that aspect of it. I hope that young people have the wisdom to like try to absorb that stuff. Right. But I didn't when I was 18, so it's easy sure. to say that now, you know, in my 30s type of thing. But I didn't even know that it was a thing when I was, you know, like, yeah. and I think, you know, you're bringing up a good point. So we've talked about this 
before, you know, we homeschool our kids. And one of the reasons we do it is because I really do believe that, you know, if you if you try to figure out what the average seven-year-old should be learning, right? I mean, kids, my goodness, they're all over the place. Yeah. Like some can't read till they're 12. Mm -hmm. Some can read when they're three. Yeah. And so to try and teach them all the same thing at the same time just seems like an exercise in futility, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, our oldest daughter, she's turning eight in a month and a half. You know, all of her friends who go to public school they start learning to read in kindergarten, or they're, they're being taught to read sure. in kindergarten, right? Many of them can't actually read till third grade, or you know, de definitely not at their grade level. And those ones get, you know, parent-teacher conferences and extra tutoring. You know, they have to go after school and pay money and do all this kind of stuff. Yeah. And so you're for, you're spending four years trying to force this kid to learn to read, and it's and the downside of that is that then they associate reading with discomfort and pain. And I mean, every parent who's had this experience knows this. Yeah. Our daughter had no interest in learning to read until she was seven. Hmm. She couldn't read at all. Hmm. And I was freaking out, right? I, yeah. I like, I'm all in on this homeschool thing. I buy into it. But then there's that moment where it's like, how much do you believe, right? Your yeah. kid can't read and her friend can yeah. fluently. Yeah. And that freaked me out. And something snapped in her one day, like hmm. her friend was reading and she couldn't. And Something clicked, and she's like, I want to learn to read. So we got her an online tutor, and in six months, she was reading at a third grade level. Okay. Six months. Yeah. So it goes back to that idea. Like, the standard pace is for chumps, Once right? fits you, all, yes. Yeah, not... and, and when you're motivated, you can learn it quick, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't know. Like, there was a point in my career where, this is before School of Motion, but I was starting to get disillusioned with the industry, and I decided, you know what I want to do? I want to make... I want to learn to code. I'm going to make an iPhone app, and that'll be my ticket out of here, right? I got a book. I worked my way through it. It took six months, and by the end of it, I literally wrote, like, the project management software Toil used. Okay. Six months, and yeah. I was a software developer, right? Yeah. Not a great one, yeah. but good enough where I probably could have gotten a job, like, as a junior developer somewhere. Um, but you can also go to a four-year institution yeah. to get that same set of skills. Yeah. Now, if you're properly motivated which some students at Ringling really are, and they'll get yeah. more out of those four years than yeah. you could possibly imagine they're getting their money's worth. But for the vast majority of 18-year-olds showing up there on day one, this sounded interesting. I've always liked cartoons, so yeah. motion, you know, yeah, sure, yeah. I like computers. Yeah. And by the time they graduate, they're like, well, I guess I have to get a job in this because now I have a degree and I have these loans. Yeah. I just think there's a better way. And yeah. it, no one's figured out all of the... Yeah. You know, like sure. liberal arts, how do you make sure that they're well-rounded? Well, yeah. I don't really know the answer to that. I yeah. I hope that it's... Well, you make them read. They how do you make them read, right? Read I'll tell you, it's not by forcing them to read. That yeah. is not going to work, but, yeah. <laughs> you know. Um, but, you know, and, and there's just so many resources now. Like, I was never interested in history. I hated it. Like, it was just boring to me. I didn't yeah. get it. My dad would argue with me. He's like, how is this not interesting to you, <laughs> the Civil War? How is history I not just interesting don't care. I just yeah. didn't care when I was a kid. Okay. And then I discovered the Hardcore History Podcast. Mm. That speaks to me. Mm. That's right. I know more about World War II now than I ever did yeah. when I was literally forced that to study really it every day in high school, podcast. right? And so I, I'm a big fan of using these new mediums and podcasts and Khan Academy and yeah. you know YouTube. No, you shouldn't yeah. have to pay a lot for liberal arts education yeah. because you can, for the cost of a book... I mean, that's essentially what you do at an institution, too. There's a reading list. Yeah. You read a book, you write a summary. Yeah. Reading, writing, and speaking. Um, I'm going to have to get you out of here. One of our camera transmitters is uh, is on its way out, so we're going to wrap it up here. But we're just going to come back to some of the comments. Right on. Questions here, and I do really appreciate your time. So uh, Sky says, what time in your life did you realize the importance of fundamentals, and how did you go about pursuing them? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, the first time I got uh, hired as a freelancer at uh, a studio, a real studio in Boston. They were called Viewpoint Creative. That was the first time I was exposed to real motion design talent. And so there were designers there doing things that I, they were, it looked so much better than what I was capable of. And I realized I can't even explain why it's good. I just know it's good. Same with animation. And so I realized that, you know, like although I was really good at After Effects and I was I kind of had a reputation as the guy who could like write expressions and figure out these crazy setups. I couldn't make stuff look good. And I knew there was something missing. And so that's when I started asking and I started diving in. And, and I actually started with design and realized that for me to get 
a lot better at design was going to be this like Herculean effort. It doesn't come naturally to me. Um, and I just had zero background in it. Animation, on the other hand, came pretty naturally to me. And so I started studying that, you know, the, the animators toolkit um, mm. and just trying to figure things out. Um, and then, ironically, spending a year at Ringling around Ed Cheatham and Morgan Williams and, yeah. and some of the great faculty they have there solidified the best way to teach all of that stuff, too. Mm. Um, so it was really yeah. when I got in the room with more talented people. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, let's see. Someone said, how important is design knowledge? You just touched on that. It's, it's absolutely essential. It's, I mean, unless yeah. you're just going to be an animator and you're in a studio environment where people are designing for you, Okay, but at this point, it seems, especially if you're going to be a freelancer, yeah, uh, learn the learn the fundamentals, learn the principles of design. So, uh, another question from Michael here: How might uh, I might how might I reach out to a buddy who just graduated college to get motivated and start researching and pursuing more? Uh, how I don't totally you understand. Motivate your buddy. So you have a buddy that is kind of you feel like not operating at full potential. It's a great question. How do you motivate somebody? Just egg his house. If I knew the answer, like I mean, you know, it's interesting. I have family members. I wish I could just, you know, come on. <laughs> um, I'll tell you, like, all I can say is what motivated me. What motivated me um, has been reading stories of people who have done things that I want to do, mm -hmm. right? Um, the book I always go back to is the four hour work week, which is like the worst title. And some people hate that book. Yeah. When I read that book, it like blew my brain up. And it like from that moment on, it changed the way I look at everything. Mm -hmm. So it could just be a matter of like recommending the right book, recommending the right podcast. Mm -hmm. A lot of times it's just, you, you just need that one match. Yeah. Um, what is your advice for those who don't live in the USA and want to work in great motion design studios? That is a tough one. We've certainly had uh, a lot of experience with that in MoGraph Mentor. Um, the visa process is a nightmare of getting into the United States. Yep. You have to make such, you have to have such a good portfolio that the studios are willing to go on that journey with you and sponsor you. Um, so the bar is higher for people in countries, especially if there's not some pre-existing, like I think we have a deal with like, Brazil and some other countries, but not Mexico. So it's like almost harder. Right. So it's like almost country specific of how difficult it is to it get is. to get a work visa. Um, and with everything going on, it might be getting harder um, by the day. I think they're even pulling some of these work visa programs back. Yeah, that is, actually d disgusts me that which it's is hard really, to get into the U. It like yeah. blows my mind. I hate it. No, um, it's ridiculous. So I apologize on behalf of the United States for that because that sucks. Um, a lot of studios now are like really on board with working remotely. Um, it can be harder to get into older studios if you can't be there in person, that's for sure. Yeah. But, you know, IV in Nashville, amazing studio, um, they are totally comfortable with remote. And so if your work's good enough, and, you know, I talk about this a lot in, in the Freelance Manifesto, actually, communication is really the key to the whole thing. Like being a good communicator, making your client feel comfortable and confident that they hired the right person, that honestly matters more than your talent level. Um, and so if you can just develop those interpersonal skills, even just over email and Zoom, Skype calls, um, you can work remotely with great studios that are in the US. That's easy. Getting a visa here is still this it's still really tough. labyrinthian process. You have process. to make, yeah. make kick-ass work. That's your absolute, um, yeah. that's absolutely your path. Um, we're gonna end it there today but joey thank you so much my friend hopefully the first of many we'll yeah do, definitely we'll do this again um and we'll continue to follow all the new courses that school of motion is putting out and everybody check out the freelance manifesto if you haven't which is a great um thing to grab if you're really interested in this conversation about freelancing so awesome joey, thanks michael appreciate it thanks go ahead and uh cool